Echo asks. Yes. Did you smoke weed right after getting a vaccine? Apparently. That's what I think. Yeah, I mean, let's put it this way. I mean, but I don't know, like right after, that's the question. It's like, you know, within two days, within two weeks, like. Let's pro- put it pro- pro- I, I bet you it's uh, a window of a week or more. And there's no yeah. doubt that I would have. Yeah. Yeah. For a couple of years, that would have been the case. Yep. Yep. The reinvestigation of vaccines, how they are produced and my own history with them has me in the following predicament. I, a professor who have literally lectured on this technology and told my students how marvelous it is, believe that I was in some sense misled in a way that I often talk about with respect to other topics, right? Where you come to believe the diagram in the textbook, Mm -hmm. right? The diagram in the textbook that describes how vaccines are produced and work does not talk about adjuvants typically, right? It talks about the underlying technology, which is elegant. If you had told me that there were ingredients in the vaccines whose purpose was to to, uh, annoy the immune system, to to agitate it, I would have said, well, how much downside is there to doing that, right? Now, in the podcast that we just released, the November 2021 podcast from The Vault, uh, Bobby Kennedy reveals that he, his sp- uh, spasmodic dystonia, the, the, uh, dystonia? Dystonia. I think it's dystonia, okay. um, the wobble in his voice, he did not know, he had no reason to think that it was the result of uh, a vaccine injury until as a lawyer who was working on the question, he ended up reading, I think the insert of a flu vaccine, which specifically named the condition he had as a known side effect. Mm-hmm. So that was very late. It did, this did not trigger his interest in it, but nonetheless, he came to think that quite possibly he was suffering from a vaccine injury himself. Now, I also wonder if several pathologies that I have might be the result of this. Mm. In particular, uh, allergies, which have um, had a pretty significant impact on my life. Mm. Uh, The three (coughs) that are most important are, long-time listeners will know I have a severe wheat allergy triggered by even the tiniest contact with wheat, a little wheat in a soy sauce that somebody includes and doesn't think about wheat because it says on the bottle it's made of soy. That's enough to trigger me right? Why do I have a wheat allergy? My ancestors have been eating wheat for thousands of years. Um, I also have a pretty debilitating allergy to grass pollen on days when the grass is flowering. uh, I, you know, I just become a drippy mess. Become so sad. Yeah. Not, not (laughs) obvious why. Sorry. That would be (laughs) just like tears flow. Like it it looks like sadness, but it's not, it's not good. Yeah. But and then there is the fact, and which I've talked about years ago on the podcast, that I have an allergy to marijuana, mm-hmm. right? It's an allergy that until my current thinking on vaccines, I credited to uh, overuse of marijuana. But I now wonder if what's going on in all of these cases is that you are injected with a vaccine that is based on antigens rather than Uh, living pathogens. It comes with an adjuvant. That adjuvant wakes up your immune system and it starts reacting to molecules that it finds present in your system, whether that's things that are leaking out of your gut and are exposed to your immune system in the case of wheat, Mm. whether it's pollen that has entered your lungs because you're breathing it in. If you happen to have gotten vaccinated during grass flowering season. Right. Or if, you know, you are using marijuana and you're smoking it. So just to put a little interesting color on this. Here, here's the thing about my marijuana allergy. And A, my marijuana allergy, in the end, I hesitate to say this because I can't believe that it would actually be net positive. I don't think it is net positive, but it certainly did make it easy to quit. Um, so, yeah. you know, here's the question. If, um, if I smoke pot, I react. I get a ton of mucus uh, in my lungs. If I eat, I'm too old to have done edibles, I guess, or I quit before edibles were a thing, but pot brownies were a thing. Mm -hmm. If I eat a pot brownie, my lungs fill with mucus, which is interesting immunologically, right? What it means is that the locus of my allergy is in my lungs. And even if the antigen comes in from the backside through the blood supply, 
uh, it still triggers that mucosal yep. uh, immunity in my lungs. So the question is, did I get a shot, probably a flu shot, in college mm -hmm. and or, or one of these uh one of these shots you needed to travel to travel that's also possible yellow fever or rabies or something or yeah, yeah I'd, I'd have to go back and look the most likely is flu shot because i got a lot of them um which i now worry it was not such a good idea they're not very effective shots and the idea of revaccinating uh in the same antigenic neighborhood again and again is uh suspect to me now but yeah, I'm not sure that they were um, so so common then. What? Flu shots. I got them. In the early 90s? Mm-hmm. Eh, um, in any case, the, the, over, the, the overarching point here is we have an epidemic of allergies, right? Now, I've heard some rather compelling explanations. We talk about, you know, the hygiene hypothesis. We talk about um, the absence of uh, parasitic worms that we have, the mm -hmm. IgE system, that's yep. the Ig immunoglobulin uh, uh, E is particularly associated with allergies, that that system is not busy because we don't have worms and it can be caused to react to things that uh, are not actually pathogens. But the question is, given the number of allergies, is one of the important factors the environmental context following an injection with an adjuvanted vaccine? Is that why I have an allergy to wheat? Is that why I have an allergy to grass? Is that why I have an allergy to marijuana? And, oh, go ahead. No, I mean, the, the, the prediction, of course, is uh, that uh, you would not see an uptick in allergies following uh, vaccination with live, attenu live attenuated vaccines. Um, if, if they also do not have adjuvants and why would they need them? Yep. Right. Uh, so that vaccines without adjuvants, uh, are at least far, far less likely, um, to produce other kinds of, of immune responses developing. Although, you know, it's, it's possible there would be some because you are triggering the immune system to respond to some degree, but the adjuvants um, produce a sort of a generalized, like, oh my God, what's going on <laughs> response in, in the immune system that uh, the prediction is uh, will then have broader, more far-reaching effects with regard specifically to things like allergies, asthma, potentially other health effects as well. Absolutely. So um, that raises a question about how we ought to be testing these things and against what. In mm -hmm. other words, you know, the net effect is really what we care about, right? You do care about yeah. your immunity to the pathogens in question, but the question is how much cost are you willing to pay for that immunity, for a one-year immunity to uh, a flu that you will get, it will suck, and you will get better, right? Mm -hmm. Would you pay with a lifetime of allergies, of seasonal allergies? You know, could you reduce the effect of the seasonal allergies um, by immunizing at a moment that was low allergen? Could you, you know, mm -hmm. have an air filter that filtered a large fraction of the air that you breathed in the two weeks following a vaccination? There are lots of things that we could potentially do. Well, but also um, dietary concerns, mm -hmm. right? So to, to your point about um, is it possible that your gluten allergy and that many other people's rise in dietary allergies is related to an effectively inflamed immune system following vaccination, uh, that doesn't inherently mean that those vaccines with their adjuvants are something that should never be given to anyone again. That's a separate question. Um, but at the very least, uh, it is quite possible that a much reduced diet in the wake of, and I don't know if that means two a days, two weeks, diet. a hypoallergenic diet uh, in the you know two days, two weeks, I don't know what the right time span would be, following vaccination, um, might then mean that you would develop fewer uh, food allergies down the road once you, because the, once you started res, once you resumed eating your normal diet after your immune system had calmed the fuck down right? yeah yeah um i would also you know again there are many things is there a protocol like you're describing that would be helpful 
There's also the question of what is the threshold of benefit with respect to the pathogen in question that needs to be reached to deal with an amorphous concern about various environmental sensitivities that you might develop. But I would point out, yes. those are not just quality of life concerns, which are not minor, right? Obviously, the pathology that I suffered before discovering that I had a wheat allergy and the pathology that I still, still suffer when I uh, end up eating wheat without knowing that it's there, right? That is a sig significant uh, degradation in quality of life. Absolutely. Um, but the uh, this is also a question of life and death, right? Lots of people, we know people who have died from asthma, mm -hmm. right? Which is an allergic response in most people. So, you know, we're talking about a serious degradation in quality of life and the loss of many lives to an undescribed pathology that may well be, and I would point out, once you know that the technology involved in vaccines involves uh, inflaming the immune system to get a more robust response, it is an absolutely obvious hypothesis that some fraction of the overactivity of the immune system is the result of that very same technology.